Welcome, everyone, um, both in person and online. This is the first time that we have a hybrid lecture event, and um, and it's very exciting because it is the, the more exciting part of the event is the in-person side of the event, which is the first time that we're, we're doing an in-person event this um, this fall. And some of our other lectures are going to be um, virtual, as you know, because there are restrictions on bringing um, out of campus people that are not affiliated with Columbia to campus. But we're very fortunate that one of our lecturers, indeed one of the leading figures in, in the field of, of preservation and sociology and, and planning uh, is just across Broadway. And so we were able to just extend an invitation to come along. And we are just really pleased to welcome Professor Aaron Passell uh, to the preservation program. And we're pleased on multiple counts. And by the way, I'm going to take off my mask because I'm six feet away from you. Uh, and so are you. So we're going to uh, follow protocol and, and take the mask off. But it's a, it's a pleasure for many reasons uh, to have you here and to welcome you here. Um, first of all, because we're celebrating the publication of this new book, which came out in early uh, in January of 21. So um, that's very exciting. I'll say a little bit more about the book in a second. But secondly, because it allows us to welcome him into our preservation community here uh, at GSAP. And really, it's a, it's a preservation community that extends to Barnard. Um, and so the real objective here is to introduce Professor Passell to you so that you know of all the exciting things that are happening across on Broadway and that you go take classes with Professor Passell as well and begin to meet the students there. Um, so it's, it's, it's a real, um, it, it's uh, wonderful to be able to make these connections and it's uh, important that you as students benefit from them. So that's the, the, the ultimate goal over here. Uh, Professor Passell is Associate Director of Urban Studies at Barnard, and there he teaches courses such as Introduction to Urban Studies, Introduction to Urban Sociology, and a senior seminar on the built environment. Uh, his work is born out of an interest in how social life and urban environments intersect. And what he's interested in, therefore, is, is these entanglements between materiality and sociality this space between physical things and our social life. And in fact, it's at that intersection, it's that, um, that realm, that realm that sociologists like Ed Soja call the third realm, um, but that people like Heidegger called being in the world, uh, Husserl called life world, and people that I'm very fond of like, uh, uh, like Donald Winnicott um, called a, uh, a, a third realm, not a world, a third realm in which objects and people kind of constitute each other and help each other make meaning and understand what their life is about. And so um, it's, it's really core to what we do here uh, in preservation to really think about not just materiality, but also sociality and in in their intersection. So um, Professor Passell's work really touches on, on the nerve of preservation. And he came to this work uh, from having done a PhD in sociology at NYU with a dissertation uh, entitled Realizing the City, the Rise of New Urbanism and the Built Environment of Social Processes. Um, this work, in, as doctoral work, became his first book called Building the New Urbanism, Places, Professions, and Profits in the American Metropolitan Landscape, which came out in 2013. 
So for those of you that don't know about new urbanism, new urbanism really, well, you can say more about it, but it, it, but it, but it was a, understood within architecture as really policy driven, but also had a very strong aesthetic about a kind of neo-traditional uh, environments, but clustering and making more density in, in suburban environments and creating more downtowns and so on. But it really made a difference because it really the, the people that um, became advocates of new urbanism became really involved in policy uh, and writing policy. Uh, but if you've seen the movie, uh, The Truman Show, the Truman Show, which kind of uh, happens in, uh, in, in um, it's kind of a Disneyland. But that's that's the kind of image of of, of new urbanism. Um, the the book in itself accounts for the rise of new urbanism in the United States by placing it in its socio political context and argues that the specific materiality of new urbanist developments reflected, reinforced, and reproduced the movement's action in the social realm. And, and you will tell us more about what that action is, you know, that political action and, and the, kinds of, um, the kinds of activist gestures towards what kind of politics, conservative politics uh, or, or, or progressive politics. But we are here to talk about his second book, Preserving Neighborhoods, How Urban Policy and Community Strategies Shape Baltimore and Brooklyn, um, which was published by Columbia University Press. Now, what's fascinating about this book is that it challenges this, um, this belief that many people have, and in fact, that oftentimes we hear from real estate developers, that historic preservation is an exclusively an elite project, and that when you designate a neighborhood, it is a railroad to gentrification. You know, it's a kind of path determined uh, way to gentrification. And Professor Passell actually takes this idea and, and challenges it and has done a tremendous service to the field to show that this is not always the outcome. It can be the outcome, but not always. And as an urban sociologist, he has investigated distinct processes of preservation, looking at specific neighborhoods and at specific activist groups in Brooklyn and Baltimore and found different realities, revealing how historic preservation can sometimes facilitate resistance to neighborhood change in communities of color and sometimes foster investment in neglected neighborhoods. Um, so the book is the subject of tonight's talk. And so without further, further ado, I ask you to please join me in welcoming Professor Passell. That was an excellent introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, first, really, before I get going, I want to make sure to thank Professor Otero Pilos. Is that how you say your last name? Otero, okay. yeah, I'm close enough. Um, and um, uh, he reached out months ago to suggest that, um, that our programs ought to know more about one another, um, which which for me was long overdue. I've been working in the Urban Studies program at Barnard for a number of years with um, little to no contact with faculty over here. And so it was, it was tremendously appreciated. And, um, and I hope, actually, you know, the beginning of a, the beginning of a beautiful relationship, right? I think, um, I think there's a lot. I know that my students um, in Urban Studies, my undergraduates in Urban Studies, would profit immensely by some exposure to the coursework and um, faculty over here and hope that it goes both ways. Um, I also want to say a quick thank you to Steph LeBlanc, um, who was very helpful in setting this up and getting everything going. Um, and, uh, but also just in part because the book was a lot of work and, and required a lot of attention. Um, both Eric Schwartz at Columbia University Press and Lowell Fry there were immensely helpful in believing in the project and um, helping me see it through. So, I, I'm particularly excited to be talking to this audience, in part because previously talking about the research that led to the book, I really only had the opportunity to talk to social scientists. Um, it means that I have to do a good deal of explaining what historic preservation looks like. It means I have to work through regulation and various practices and such. And 
um, and sometimes lose the opportunity to really focus on the distinctiveness of the sorts of changes that I'm trying to observe in places that I'm trying to talk about. So I'm excited not to have to explain a number of things to you, um, but it also means that, um, but it also means that I'm eager for your insight or correction of my sort of misinterpretations of some of these connections. Um, I have a lot that I want to cover, um, in part because this is uh, this is my first opportunity to really talk about the book as a whole, and um, and that means that I'm gonna I'm gonna work as sort of as hard and fast as I can through a great, a great deal of material, but it also means that I'm gonna brush past details about method and some and various sorts of things that are in fact critical to the argument, and so I really want to invite you to interrupt me. If, I, if I'm hitting a point, if, I'm, if I've reached a, a set of conclusions, if, I've, um, if I'm providing detail that doesn't get any sense because I haven't grounded it, just, just let me know. Um, and, uh, and we can work to, to remedy that. So what I really want to do um, in sort of our conversation in my talk tonight, and I hope our conversation too, is what I do in the book, and that's an effort to draw contrasts. So um, as um, Professor Otero Carlos already pointed out, right, there is, there is, this, there is this really standing presumption um, in real estate economics, in planning um, scholarship, that historic district designation leads to gentrification. And I, um, speaking, as, you know, speaking as a sociologist, someone who sort of looks for sources constantly in reading scholarship, when I first encountered these claims, I encountered these claims as utterly unfounded ones, right? Um, important scholars of preservation, uh, listing and listing and large, perhaps the most cited article um, that I discovered in the planning scholarship on historic preservation, uh, they toss off a claim like this connection to displacement. Um, Cohen, whose work I use elsewhere, and is really important in thinking seriously about preservation's role in major American cities. Similarly, um, tosses off a claim uh, like this without going on to demonstrate it later in their work, without citing the studies that establish the sorts of claims they're doing. So the beginning of this project, as much as anything else, was a sort of amazement with the fact, the, the presumption of this connection and the fact that it had been, as far as I could understand, um, pretty thoroughly untested. Um, I, I went down a sort of rabbit hole of trying to think about, um, there are a number of studies of the relationship of uh, preservation regulation to property prices, um, and they tend to be um, rather <laughs> methodologically difficult, but also ultimately don't really show very much. So, um, so I began to think about what it would mean to remedy what I saw as the shortcomings of the presumptions that I had discovered, the, the research that I was encountering. And um, what I realized, as much as anything I wanted to do, was to complicate, right? I want to draw contrasts in the book, I want to draw contrasts tonight. So as to complicate and problematize, problem, complicate these assumptions, problematize these assumptions. And, and ultimately, to argue to you that historic preservation, historic district designation, and its relationship to neighborhood um, has to be understood as radically contingent. It's specific to place, and more than that, specific to those places' history and their relationships to the broader cities and metropolitan regions in which they occur. So, um, initially, when I initially sort of started talking to the press about the book, I had a much tidier um, sort of argument. And, and Eric was disappointed when I said, well, now it looks like the argument of the book is it's complicated, right? And uh, that's a little harder to sell, it's complicated. But that's, that's part of what I want to show you tonight, is that it's complicated. Um, one of the things I'm going to do, and, and um, you'll have to see what you think about it, is in drawing contrasts, I want to perhaps exaggerate some of the differences between two very different places. So much of my sort of work here is emerging from research in Baltimore that's substantially quantitative and uh, research in central Brooklyn, which is substantially qualitative based primarily on interviews and observation. And um, what I found in the Baltimore case was that 
preservation activity was substantially top down. It was mostly driven by the uh, by CHAP, the Commission on Historic and Architectural Preservation in the city planning department, and by an advocacy organization called Baltimore Heritage. That preservation really seems to happen mostly at the city level and sort of to trickle down in its effects to neighborhoods. Whereas by contrast in central Brooklyn, it was really a locally driven phenomenon. It tended to be neighborhood activists um, undertaking landmarking efforts in response to the neighborhood conditions that they were encountering. So along with all the other contrasts I want to draw, I want to, I want to ask you to keep in mind this sort of top-down, bottom-up distinction, which I can say more about too. So um, the key thing I want to do tonight is to really draw out this contrast between um, what I found in Baltimore and what I find in Brooklyn. Um, if I have time, I will also try to talk to you a little bit about the next steps, the final steps that I take in the book, which is um, to, uh, to inquire into the things that make these cities so different from each other, to really try to look at the role of vacancy and abandonment in Baltimore, um, this radically shrunk city, a city that's lost something on the a third of its population since 1950. Um, and then by contrast, the effects of intensive development, intensive development pressure in central Brooklyn. Um, and so we'll see if we can work our way around to that. Um, but uh, but I want to get I want to get into Baltimore. So um, in Baltimore, um, there are um, since 1969, um, 86 historic districts have been designated. You'll see them um, on this map, which you may or not, may not see particularly well, but um, some of them are nationally, uh, national register districts, some of them are locally designated, some of them are both. Um, and um, conveniently for me, um, the Baltimore Planning Department, up until recently, I should say they haven't continued to publish data about Baltimore in what they call neighborhood statistical areas. So on this map, um, everything with the black outline is neighborhood statistical area. So I could do a very simple task, um, or a rather complicated task, but, um, but technically simple um, for a relatively technologically unsophisticated person which is to match historic districts to neighborhood statistical areas. Um, of the 55 historic districts in Baltimore that are in residential neighborhoods, um, 73 neighborhood statistical areas are within those 55 historic districts. Then there are 155 neighborhood statistical areas that are not within historic districts. So this gave me the opportunity. Um, the Baltimore Planning Department reports data for um, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010 about these neighborhood statistical areas. It gave me the opportunity to both compare the historic districts to the never designated parts of the city, and also to try to think about what demographic conditions were like in neighborhoods prior to and after designation. So um, the first thing to say, and I want to say a little bit more about, about clusters of historic districts. The first thing to say is that historic districts look different. Historic districts look different than never designated parts of the city. Um, as Baltimore loses population um, over the sort of, uh, 40 years, 50 years for which I had data, um, it loses the never designated areas of the city, lose white population in particular um, at a pretty rapid pace. And the historic districts in the city, which were whiter to begin with, um, lose white population at a substantially slower pace. And it's some of the to plateau, more or less. So the first, first thing to notice is that historic districts seem to be different from never designated parts of the city. Um, the white population declines more slowly, stabilizes. Um, also, we see in this side, and I'll tell you just a little bit, 
about the clusters in just a second, you also see it in this image that historic districts and these uh, four clusters are all historic districts. Um, historic districts are uh, better educated than the number of designated parts of the city. The way we typically measure um, education is the percent of the population that has a bachelor's degree or greater that is over 25. And so that's what's measured here. Um, interestingly, for my purposes, um, the 55 historic districts, districts for which I was, um, for which I had data matched to neighborhood statistical areas, came in clusters. There were um, there were six historic districts designated in the period between 69 and 74. There were eight designated between 80 and 83, uh, 22 between 2001 and 2004, and 17 between 2006 and 2015. Um, and before you ask, I don't know why. Um, one of the things, one of the questions that remain unanswered for me about Baltimore is what determined these sorts of patterns? If you look very carefully at designation dates, it turns out that many of the historic districts were designated in the week between Christmas and New Year's, at least not some number of them. So something about the city council, something about mayoral business at the end of the calendar year, I don't know, but this is um, all of this that serves a little bit of research. But what I want you to notice about this piece is, and, and I want to get more into the clusters, is the earliest districts that were designated, um, enabling legislation made designation possible in 1969. Um, in Baltimore, the earliest districts that were designated are much the highest status of all of the neighborhoods that, that I have data for in Baltimore. Um, this, uh, this tallest line is the number of people in these historic districts with uh, bachelor's degrees or greater um, in 2010. And you can see uh, at, at roughly 70%, of the population, that's radically disproportionate with both the rest of Baltimore and um, the rest of the United States. Um, the historic districts um, decline in their relative prestige and relative status for the rest of the city um, in these clusters as time passes. And perhaps most interestingly, and I think we'll get back around to this, the most recent cluster of historic districts designated are much the most like the rest of the city. So whereas earliest districts tended to be higher status places, um, the most recent, it's now increasingly the case that designation is something that's undertaken in regard to neighborhoods that are much like the rest of the city. Yeah. When you say number designated districts, is that an average of 69 to 2015, or that's really 2006 to 2015 as well? Um, this is, so this is data for 70, 80, 90, 2000, 2010. Um, these are these are uh, the proportion of people with college degrees living in the neighborhood statistical areas that match with the districts that were designated in 2006. Okay, so, so they're all they're all cross section of the, the present, but you're just saying, breaking it out in terms of when the district was was designated. Uh, yeah, clustering, clustering the districts according to their original designation date, yeah. and trying mostly here to show you at this at this stage, really just trying to show you that um, in this case, um, this first data point is 1970, so it's right at the beginning of the period in which they're designated. Um, they were still higher status neighborhoods, many more educated people than in other parts of the city. Um, and that continues to remain in But so then let me tell you, uh, right, um, let me say a little bit more. Historic districts look different, but we don't yet know what makes them different, right? Does designation make them different? Well, we don't have data on that yet. And what this data shows us is that historic districts are actually they were pretty different before designation and are actually substantially different from one another and also changing over time. So um, these are the demographic characteristics prior to designation. So this is data from 1970 for the cluster of historic districts designated in the 69 to 74 period. 
Um, that's the percent white. They're obviously overwhelmingly white. And uh, a significant percentage of people with college degrees and median household income um, doesn't tell us a whole lot because this is uh, $1970 by comparison. So um, I didn't normalize the uh, median household income across these graphs. Um, the, um, and then if we step over here, what we see is I, um, I divided the characteristics of each of the clusters by the characteristics of never designated areas at the same data point. So that what we would get here is, um, is a sense of relative, right? That the characteristics of the highest um, status group of cluster of historic districts is uh, almost the percent with uh, college degrees is almost two and a half times as many people had college degrees in the number of designated parts of the city. So, um, so what we see here is following the conclusion, following the observation that the historic districts are different, we now see that historic districts are also different from one another, that they were different before they designated, um, and that they um, and that they are decreasingly different. So this cluster that is designated in the 2006-2015 period, the loosest cluster of the bunch, 100% um, means that they're almost identical to never designated parts of the city. So, so again, the clusters start relatively different from the designated parts of the city and become much closer to them. But one other thing I want you to notice about this graph is that the 1980-1983 cluster um, income in that cluster was only slightly larger than half the income average in every designated parts of the city. So there's something distinct and somewhat interesting about this cluster too. We have an extremely high status cluster here, and then the cluster of historic districts in the 80 to 83 period is also different and potentially interesting in the sense that it was a lower income cluster of neighborhoods, at least, and there are other things that we can distinguish about. Okay, so we've got the idea that historic districts are different. We've got the idea that historic districts are different from one another and that they're changing over time. Um, that they were different before designation. Um, but we don't yet have anything to suggest whether um, designation does something. In fact, everything I've shown you so far, I think, suggests that um, designation doesn't necessarily do anything to neighborhoods, that, uh, that these neighborhoods have their particular status characteristics and then they designate. So the, one of the next things I did trying to think about about whether there's a way of distinguishing whether or not designation did things to neighborhoods was to do what I call a matched pairs study. The idea of a Heinlein matched pairs study um, came from work uh, by a sociologist named Patrick Sharkey, who's interested in, um, in people's life courses in different neighborhoods. And so what he did was to find children in Chicago um, one who, who's, um, whose sort of household and demographic characteristics very carefully match one another. One of them lived in a neighborhood of concentrated disadvantage uh, for primarily people of color, uh, high rates of unemployment, et cetera. The other lived in, in a relatively privileged neighborhood, a, 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 a neighborhood with a less concentrated degree of disadvantage. And then he tracked those those kids over time to see how it was that the neighborhoods that they grew up in affected their ultimate life chances, and various other various outcomes. So I was trying to do something similar. I went looking for um, I went looking for historic districts and neighborhoods, never designated neighborhoods, that look very similar at a particular point in time, in the hopes of being able to track them going forward to see if they may similar or diverge. And what I found well, was the answer was they diverged. Um, can um, a historic district that was substantially like Willow Mill Hill and Moral Park in 1980 at the time it designated 
Um, it was substantially like them in terms of educational attainments would have matched here, but I matched, but I matched um, Canton in terms of uh, percent weight and median household income as well. Canton designated when Brooklyn Mill Hill and Park Mill we didn't. And this is their trajectory in terms of educational attainment and that's Canton's. So for all of my concern, interest, confusion in sort of trying to draw out the relationship between historic district designation and neighborhoods and try to suggest that frequently what we see is high, high prestige neighborhoods designate, so it's not a designation and gentrification relationship. It might be that at least in some occasional cases, the designation is doing some work. It seems certainly something is doing some work here to distinguish from um, similarly, um, Butchers Hill and Lincoln Square, both historic districts designated in the 1980, were very demographically similar across the way measures, Irvington and Beachfield, and in the 30 years post 1980, Butchers Hill and Lincoln Square um, changed, where Irvington and Beachfield really didn't, uh, didn't change a whole lot. That suggests to me that designation might be doing something. It might be doing something in these cases. What exactly? I'm not sure. Is it attracting people with higher degrees of education to the neighborhood? That would seem like the obvious conclusion. Um, and then that does seem rather like the gentrification claim that um, some people make about historic district designation. So what I really want to point out to you about Baltimore is, as I said to begin with, it's complicated. Um, historic districts are demographically different than never designated parts of the city. They're demographically different from one another. Um, the earliest cluster is much higher status than the later ones. I, um, in the case of the earliest cluster, and I've seen this in a couple of other cities as well, I like to think of that sort of potential for protecting prestige as a kind of fortification. Um, Sometimes a higher status precedes designation. Other times, designation seems to spur a change in status, like we see here. Uh, so that raises a set of questions about using it as a strategy for directing investment in the neighborhoods. Um, one of the pieces I've sort of left out from interviewing folks involved in preservation in Baltimore is that um, there's a historic tax credit that allows people to um, defer taxes on increases in value of preserved properties. So if you can invest a significant amount of money in rehabilitating um, a, a historic property and not pay the taxes on the increase in value um, for at least 10 years, and it's a transferable tax credit. So you can, you can small scale developers can use your houses and then sell, sell them to, um, to people who will benefit from the tax credit. Um, as well. Uh, so there's a possibility to use um, historic designation as a way of channeling um, reinvestment, channeling funding and redevelopment. Um, but we need to be thoughtful about what it's doing when we do that, since there are indications at least that it might cause some kind of neighborhood change. And in other circumstances, it seems not to. Um, so, so I hope that's sort of unsatisfying. Um, I hope that I hope that I've sort of uh, I've sort of confused as much as I have um, enlightened, um, because that's sort of the intention really to is to is to complicate things here to problematize the basic assumptions. Um, I want to shift, and and before I shift, I can say, um, are there sort of basic questions about Baltimore you want to tackle before we shift on to central? Brooklyn? Not the number. Okay, we can come back to it. Um, I'm going to shift to thinking about central Brooklyn. So the situation in central Brooklyn is in some ways substantially less complicated. It's certainly less complicated in terms of the presumption of the connection between um, historic district designation, or landmark designation in the New York case, um, and gentrification, because the neighborhoods I'm interested in in central Brooklyn uh, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights North, and South to some degree. Crown Heights will come back into the story at some point, and they saw 
these neighborhoods are all gentrifying before they get landmarked. So there's no there's no possibility even really of the landmarking followed by gentrification relationship because gentrification is already well at work. Um, these are the four sort of neighborhoods. This is their this is their location um, in Brooklyn, Central Brooklyn, um, and there's an important um, there's an important contrast here between. One of the important contrasts here um, between uh, Central Brooklyn and Baltimore is where I really tried to emphasize the variation, the diversity of relationships between preservation, between designation and uh, neighborhood change in Baltimore. What I want to emphasize in the Brooklyn case is that there's really a consistency of designation as a response to neighborhood change, despite some variation in these neighborhoods. These neighborhoods are uh, are similar in a number of respects, in particular, um, and an architect in the audience can correct me, but in particular, they share um, late 19th century, early 20th century brownstone townhouses um, throughout um, much of these neighborhoods. So it's a relatively consistent, relatively similar environment across these three neighborhoods. And then they are also demographic, historically at least, are demographically relatively similar and share various sorts of social networks and connections across these neighborhoods. Um, so, uh, why are we in Central Brooklyn? Um, for two reasons. Um, one is that I was eager to find a radical contrast to a shrinking and shrunk Baltimore, a city with a great deal of vacancy and abandonment, undertaking preservation for a specific set of reasons. And another is um, about the realities of research. And that comes down to this is where I had connections. Um, a, a good friend who lives in Prospect Heights, I mentioned the project to him. And he said, oh, I know somebody who works on that. Uh, let me introduce you. So he introduced me to Yib, who introduced me to Suzanne, who introduced me to Morgan, and um, thus unrolled uh, a set of connections and access to various uh, preservation advocates and activists in these three neighborhoods, all of whom knew each other, and many of whom were connected through someone, um, some of you may have encountered it, a uh, man named Simeon Bankoff, who works for uh, the Historic Districts, Historic Districts Council um, in Manhattan, but is a resource for people all over New York City and helps facilitate connections among them. So, um, so we're here, uh, we're here in Central Brooklyn for these reasons. Um, as I've indicated, um, my method here was um, interviewing um, preservation advocates, effectively neighborhood by neighborhood, visiting these neighborhoods, walking them, and on a couple of occasions getting to observe the deliberations of Community Board 3's ad hoc committee on landmarking. Uh, Community Board 3 uh, operates in that side, and their uh, ad hoc landmark committee is uh, the group that considers uh, proposals to make changes to buildings within the historic district that's in that stuff. So, um, what it, so I've got a couple of slides that we can spend a couple of on, you know, less so pointing out to you that I'm not the only person who can make bed style and Crown Heights uh, and Prospect Heights are gentrifying. Um, the Furman Center at NYU um, in a 2016 study um, documented the degree of gentrification in these places in a couple of different ways, pointing out the ways in which um, income was increasing more quickly than in other parts of the city. Uh, median rents were increasing you know, uh, faster than other parts of the city. And, um, and then uh, using um, pretty conventional sociological markers for gentrification, changes in the demographics of the population, often meaning an increase in white population um, and an increase in educational attainment. Um, this, again, is data from uh, an excellent source of data called Core Data NYC, which is run by the Sperman Center, um, which gives us uh, information at what they call suburb areas um, about uh, change over time. The data only goes back to 2005, but nevertheless, it's relatively useful. 
So we see in these scenarios further evidence of the in movement of whites, the out movement or displacement of long term black residents, um, and uh, changes in educational attainment, which I think of as uh, a marker for class. Things, right? uh, in the United States, the possession of a college degree is often the difference between access to working class employment and professional employment, at least as part of it. So, um, if you'll if you'll agree with me for the moment that that this that Central Brooklyn um, was vigorously uh, gentrifying in this period, then we can start to think about what um, emerges from talking to folks. So what I saw in my interviews with preservation activists in these three parts of Central Brooklyn, and I really focused on um, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights North, and Bed-Stuy, was uh, a number of things emerged. So one was a sense of threat and response, that landmarking in these neighborhoods was often a response to a perceived threat to change the neighborhoods, a sense that the neighborhood was about to be altered significantly, the built environment. Um, also emerging from these interviews was a, a sense of aesthetic concerns. Um, as you'll see from a couple of the sort of quotes I've got on the next slide, much of what's going on is, is a kind of social preservation effort. Um, many of these preservation advocates in these neighborhoods are pursuing landmark status in the hopes of maintaining in place communities that have been there for decades, knowing that uh, landmark districting is not a perfect tool for that end, but turning to it is the only tool available. But I don't want to de-emphasize the fact that these are also people who value the historic nature of the neighborhoods that they're inhabiting, recognize in, in significant detail various historic aspects of the diversity of buildings that they've got, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, um, these are uh, amateur, uh, historic experts also specifically concerned with various sorts of um, community preservation. Um, one of the things that emerged, though, particularly for me, and, and you, you'll see that I'll, I'll want to come back to this later, is that the effort to landmark often functioned as a community building or group building. It, it had a community building effect. So um, undertaking landmarking whether the landmarking was accomplished or not, often put in place a community group that could produce other outcomes in addition. Um, the Crown Heights North Association stands out in particular um, in that it went on, that organization went on to intervene in the displacement of uh, mom and pops because of increasing commercial rents and um, works to help people avoid predatory lending in the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. So um, one of the things that I really want to take away from research in Brooklyn was the sense that uh, the pursuit of landmarking sometimes put in place groups that produce other outcomes. There are just a couple more things that I want to note um, that emerged from the interviews. One was the sense of, uh, of a local control, the pursuit of a local control of development processes. Um, but then also, all the people I talked to recognize the limits of landmarking. That landmarking could do some things, but it couldn't do others. And as I say, they also they seem to have the sense that it was the tool they worked. So, um, in, uh, here are just a few examples from my interviews in Prospect Heights. Um, one of the things that uh, that one of the activists I spoke to really emphasized. Was an issue was the issue of stopping visual intrusion. Um, the in Prospect Heights, uh, some number of blocks in Prospect Heights are um, are brownstone row houses surrounding uh, what functions as sort of an almost common green space, sometimes cut up by fences, but regardless, open to the sky. And um, the neighborhood, the folks I spoke to in this neighborhood um, referred to it as the hole in the donut and objected to the fact that to intrusions into the hole 
Um, one of the things that was going on in Prospect Heights in the uh, early 1990s was that very small scale developers were buying up these three and a half story towns and um, uh, knocking out the back wall so that they could build, so they could extend 30 or eh, 20 or 30 feet into the backyard. So as to be able to then cut the building into four sort of reasonable sized apartments. And that was the, that was the, um, that was the threat to which many Prospect Heights residents were responding, that this, this intrusion into the whole world. Um, the leader of much of the landmarking effort in Prospect Heights uh, said to me that he believed historic designation inserts an element of democracy into land use decisions. I say hmm, there because I'm not sure I think this is democracy necessary. And I think, but I think it's something to be thinking about seriously. It's certainly, um, and as, as I sort of found later, as I kept talking to people, it certainly exposes development decisions to a kind of community deliberation, um, which might be, which might be democracy. Um, we can talk that through. So in something like the in the first you know, couple of comments, we see something like this issue of threat. The effort to respond, the idea of local control. Um, we also see in other in another interview um, the commitment to aesthetics, um, the group building efforts, and also the limits and consequences of landmarking. So um, another activist I talked to uh, explained the house tours that um, early preservation activists in Prospect Heights had undertaken, showing off what the work they had done, finding things in common with other people's experiences, working with these old houses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, the house tours um, produced a sense of community among the customers, but they also became victims of their own success. They, um, they exposed these beautiful old houses to people who were able to pay more for them, among other things, and contribute perhaps to increasing property prices. So, um, Perverse consequences, the limits of, land, of landmarking in that case. In Crown Heights North, we see again similar sorts of things. Um, I didn't bring my slide about the Elkins House. The Elkins House was called in the local press the oldest and saddest house in Brooklyn. Um, it was built in something like 1816 um, and still in roughly its original condition. And um, in Crown Heights North, and uh, was bought by a developer who was planning to tear it down and build an apartment house in, in its place. Um, interestingly, no one wants to defend the aesthetics of the Yagans House, um, just its right to continue to be where it's always been. Um, so local advocates apparently literally stopped the bulldozer um, with, uh, with a, a preservation order um, hours before demolition was supposed to occur. And this threat to the Elkins House was apparently really what galvanized the community, um, it, the, the group, um, the, the broader neighborhood in Crown Heights North, um, who, about which they said, if we don't do this, this is what can happen. We don't landmark. And Crown Heights North, as I think I indicated before, is that was the instance in which I found most clearly the sense that pulling together the preservation effort also found a community group um, that then could undertake other activities to defend, to defend and preserve the community. Um, lastly, bed -Stuy, um, we see again the sense of threat and the necessity of response. Like if we don't designate, developers are going to come here and um, and I can't reproduce the tone with which this interview actually he told me this. He said, and developers do not care. Right? They don't contribute to preserving it, he argued. And um, perhaps notably, though, also in bed -Stuy was an interview with a young Black architect who was the grandchildren of the people who had bought the uh, bedside brownstone that he still lived in. And he was adamant that, that landmarking was not going to preserve the community as he, as he understood it. And um, so that he was, um, while he was central to this effort, he was also in disagreement with some of the people 
uh, he was working alongside who imagined that landmarking might contribute to a kind of community preservation effort. Um, I want to back up and say, too, that many of the people involved in landmarking in Prospect Heights were uh, relative newcomers, people who moved in the 90s, most of them white, um, where Prospect Heights had been predominantly black through at least the 1780s. Um, and so there is some slightly complex recognition upon the part of many of these activists that, yeah. that they are simultaneously um, facilitating this landmarking effort and um, part of the problem that they are trying to remedy, mitigate, correct. So um, there's a complicated role for many of these activists. Um, so the interviews led me to do something which I don't normally do, which was to try to think about whether I could sort of model a set of relationships. Um, I want to say that one of the things that made me nervous about preparing this talk was the sense that, that all of my visuals were going to be hopelessly um, out of touch in, uh, across the street at the um, School of Architecture and Learning and Vision. Um, so you guys will just have to make do these rather lame visuals. But here's what, here's what I want to suggest, and here's what is actually most important about, about the effort to model for me. What I saw again and again in the conversations I had with people in Central was this sense uh, that that threat, that some kind of threat was really the trigger event. Whether it was the Elkins House in Crown Heights North or what, or, uh, what became Atlantic Yards and the Barclay Center um, at the edge of Prospect Heights, um, or, um, or various um, developers' work in Bed Stuy. Um, Threat, visual intrusion, and demolition triggered the need to, to respond. And these responses took the, it took the form of landmark districts, um, which come with the local review apparatus, right? Uh, the people who make decisions about what's acceptable in terms of changes to historic properties, et cetera. But the step from threat to response implementing landmark districts had to pass through a root building process. You couldn't accomplish landmarking without first, um, some of you must know more than I do about, the, about how landmarking actually gets done in New York City, um, you, but you couldn't accomplish it without building a group that would document the year of construction of all of the contributing buildings within the district and usually provide photos and descriptions and made an exhausting process of documenting the historic nature of the structures within the district. And that group building process then also led to a sense of local control and um, addressing various ongoing concerns. Uh, this was, they also confronted the limits of landmark districting, right? Landmark districting doesn't do anything to press. So, Various different people I talked to at Prospect Heights referred to the fact that um, brownstones there were now, at the time, a million, two million dollars, right? The fact that they had protected them from demolition or significant alteration did nothing to prevent people from, with more money from buying them and did nothing to discourage longtime residents from taking advantage of the fact that there were people with lots of money interested in buying them. Um, that's one of the sets of complex relationships in this whole story. So, um, let me tell you just a little bit in further drawing out the contrast between these two cases about vacancy and abandonment in Baltimore and about the problems of landmarking in a context of intense uh, development pressure in central Brooklyn. Um, and then I'll and then I'll shut up and ask you a few questions. So, what a problem that I never really came, I never really got my head around 
was the fact that in historic districts in Baltimore, there are higher rates of vacancy. Um, this is, um, these are my uh, historic district clusters rearranged. These are vacancy rates in 1980, vacancy rates in 1990, vacancy rates in 2000, 2010. So you can see a couple of things. One is, in general, vacancy rates increase over this period. With the exception of the 1980 to 1983 cluster, which I already pointed to, was a relatively low income cluster. Interestingly, it has about well, the high rates of vacancy across these years, with the exception of this one, which is so sort of odd and not. Um, but um, these are high rates of vacancy, particularly in relation in the earlier years to the never designated parts of the city. So, in particular, in 1980, the never designated parts of the city would have substantially lower rates of vacancy than any of we start clusters, we start district clusters. Still, um, still here, they're increasing, still a little lower, they're increasing, and still again increasing, but a little lower than just a few clusters. So, the first thing I want to say about this is I don't know why this is the case. I don't know why um, historic districts have higher rates of vacancy, but it seems to me that it's an obvious problem for preservation in the sense. In, in a few senses, at least. Um, one is that vacancy is not simply a symptom of decline, but it's also a cause. An observation I had with Cohen, who I smeared in my first slide, so I'll go back to recognize that he could, has contributed important things as well. Um, so uh, neighborhoods with high rates of vacancy are neighborhoods that are harder to maintain simply because there are push factors in terms of um, encouraging people to leave, um, discouraging people from moving in. Uh, there are a couple of, I, I, tried some, I tried some statistical techniques to see if I could figure out relationships between vacancy and the historic nature of the neighborhoods, and I didn't really find very much. Um, I found a couple of sort of obvious relationships, like lower average income in one, um, and one day at one predicted higher rates of vacancy later. Um, but this didn't tell me very much. This seemed relatively straightforward. So um, it, this is also a concern because vacancy leads to abandonment and demolition by neglect. So to the degree that um, historic neighborhoods um, are protected in Baltimore, the historic districts are protected by, um, by their designation, um, it's uh, difficult to significantly alter the structures in those neighborhoods. But if those structures are simply allowed to fall down, they can be replaced um, with structures that defy the, standard, uh, the standards of the historic, historic district. So demolition by neglect is an opportunity for property owners to avoid the constraints of, of operating, maintaining, uh, properties within a historic district, and vacancy and abandonment raise the concern, concerns about demolition by neglect, at least for me. So, um, so that's one that's one piece of all of this. Um, the another piece is that um, community activists in Baltimore don't know what to do about the vacancy and abandonment they confront in their neighborhood. Um, they find in the city um, uh, an unsympathetic uh, partner. And um, in interesting and complicated sort of ways, a kind of informational and positional asymmetry is the way I think of it. The um, actors within the city government who are in charge of issues of vacancy and abandonment are thinking about the entire city while these activists are thinking about their own neighborhoods and the experience of the home. And so we've got one group who's responsible for thinking, oh, I've, I've lost track of it, it's something like 120,000 parcels in the city of Baltimore. Um, and then another group is really thinking about their own property, the properties nearest them. So there's this, this problem of two groups trying to work together who have such very different experiences and ideas about the city that they're talking about. Um, hard to to communicate. And then the, just the last point I want to make about vacancy and abandonment in Baltimore is about the contemporary moment. 
And that's characterized by an effort called Project Core. And I can't remember what Core stands for, but I can find out for you if you want to know. Project Core is intended to demolish 4,000 vacant buildings in Baltimore over a few years. 4,000 would um, change the landscape of Baltimore but estimates of how many vacants there are in Baltimore range from 16,000 to 40,000. Turns out that counting vacancy is really difficult. And so 4,000 would be a contract, would be something, but not a vast, um, but not a, not a profound effect necessarily on the number of vacancies in Baltimore. But what's still more interesting about Project Core is that it has discovered something that people have discovered elsewhere which is that it's awfully difficult to demolish vacant buildings because tracing title, figuring out who owns the building, turns out to be extremely difficult. And, and you can't, in most circumstances, leave demolish the building until you've identified and notified the owner. So Project Core set out to demolish 4,000 buildings and has effectively failed to do so. Um, it has, uh, at last time I checked, demolished something under 160 or 200 buildings. And that means two things in particular. One is that preservation activists in Baltimore are actually pretty cheerful about Project Core. They mostly think of it as, um, as ineffectual and a long way from doing any significant damage to the one star architecture in the city. The other curiosity, of curiosity about Project Core is as the leaders responsible for Project Core have discovered how difficult it is to actually tear down buildings, they've shifted the funding streams in Project Core to doing things that preservation activists have been calling for for decades, various kinds of rehabilitation and stabilization in historic neighborhoods. So it's a, the, if my, the beginnings of my presentation of Baltimore were complicated, the contemporary moment remains complicated in Baltimore as do the various sorts of policies that are relevant. And um, uh, just a last thought about Brooklyn, and then I'm going to leave you with just a couple of conclusions. So, um, the thing that emerged, the thing that emerged from my efforts to dig deeper into the question of what it meant to be trying to do various kinds of preservation, both historic preservation and landmarking, and also a kind of social preservation in the context of intense development pressure in central Brooklyn. Um, was a sense of the importance of, uh, of local politics and really intensively local politics. That um, the efforts to landmark were really about building groups, and these groups were uh, groups of personalities. Um, that um, various interviewees of mine pointed out that it was that these efforts were really about who showed up. Um, and in fact, one of the guys I talked to showed up in so many different places that he explained that he was giving himself approval in one group to do things in other groups, right? So this is really about, it's about who shows up. Anyone interested can, can get involved, but the risk there is that anyone interested can get involved. Um, and uh, the process really turns on who shows up and who's willing to keep showing up. And sometimes, there are complications around personal lives. Some of these processes broke down. Some of, there were aspects of these projects that failed because of conflicts among personalities. And then there are also um, the difficulties of relying on volunteer uh, workforce um, in and around these landmark efforts. Uh, one of the reasons that Crown and South didn't feature prominently in my presentation uh, or in my research about Brooklyn is that Crown and South has not yet landmarked, despite the efforts of um, one advocate in particular to get significant parts of crime itself landmarked, in part because she's had a sort of personal uh, crisis that has prevented her uh, ongoing worship. And she was so much, she was so much the process almost in its entirety that with her dropping out, the process is not. Um, so uh, that was a very quick version of Central Brooklyn, but I really want to really wind up, and I want to wind up with what I hope is relatively obvious at this point. And that is re returning to this claim that I made to you very early on, that the nature of the relationship between preservation and 
change is radically contingent. It's about the specific neighborhood, it's about the people who inhabit it, it's about that neighborhood's history, it's about that neighborhood's relationship to other neighborhoods in the city, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is, it's really about the specifics of the particular process. Um, and that means that, um, that whether it's a revitalization effort or gentrification mitigation effort, um, the actors have to be extremely attentive to the specifics of the relationships wherever they are. Um, the other thing I want to argue, and, and I hope this is a sympathetic audience for this argument, and I also realize it risks overstating things very slightly, is that preservation regulation is the only urban policy intervention left that puts significant local control of the environment in the hands of neighborhood actors. Um, speaking to uh, people in uh, the preservation of bureaucracy in New York City um, was really where I developed this impression. They agreed, as did um, folks in Baltimore, that that preservation was roughly it. That that was where local control happened. Um, and then finally, something that I've already delivered in the sense that local organizations that form around preservation goals um, may also ultimately carry out other sorts of efforts. Uh, I'm going to stop there. And thank you for your attention. Your further questions. Thank you. Great talk. Um, we have some Brooklyn experts and natives in the in the audience, so um, you, you might. I don't know if anybody is from Baltimore over right here, or well, has been to Baltimore. Well, we should. So, um, but so. I thought it was very, so maybe I'll, I'll just start and, you know, unless there's, you know, while you kind of all over a question or your thoughts or comments, just to get us kind of warmed up for um, um, the discussion. But so it, you, you did, it, um, you know, the way that you presented the, the, your evidence was really convincing. Right, we understood that that um, that the kind of blanket claims that you know preservation leads to gentrification really um, are just that they're blanket claims and they don't really hold up to scrutiny. Once you start looking at the at the evidence, it is it is as you say contingent and and, and different in, in every in every scenario. And I was curious about the different methodology that we use. So you are very um, forthright about that and very um, uh, deliberate about that. that. That you wanted to study one way in Baltimore quantitatively and qualitatively somewhere else. Um, but you could have studied it quantitatively here in New York as well, right? I mean, you had the data and you could have done. So I was wondering why you made that choice. Why, why did you want to explore these two avenues? Rather than the same in both places, or or both quantitative and qualitative in both places. Sure, it's a question you get a lot. Uh, so, so I've overstated the I've overstated the contrast just slightly in the sense that I did I did do a real amount of interviewing of preservation leaders in Baltimore, and then I drew on the firm and centers quantitative data about um, to complement the interview data. But um, but to get to the point of the question, um, I feel very strongly that the, the data needs to be the, the, the data that I want to use to present my case should be the most compelling data available in relation to particular cases and. Um, and so, so I try to be transparent about that, not to claim, not to claim some sort of perfect comparison, but instead to suggest that what I'm trying to do, there's, there's an idea that emerges occasionally in case studies of doing a most different comparison, 
And that's almost what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take up two cities uh, at, at some level opposite poles of development trajectories. And then say um, that simply to use the same research methods in both would not serve the best interests of representing them in the most compelling way. So, um, so I've already admitted that part of this was about convenience. There was there was data available about Baltimore that I could in fact process and not and not a GIS user of any sophistication. Take this sophisticated GIS user could in some ways do a do a better one to study yeah, what I meant. And um, and then and that also explains the, the relatively superficial type data. But I also really believe in sort of the um, I was about to say truth, which my few students in the room know as a word that I hate. Um, not so much the truth of the data as the, the, the particular kinds of data are compelling in terms of capturing the um, the case. Other questions, thoughts, reactions, please go ahead. I'm just really curious to know more about your vacancies. Um, because I mean particularly like how many you work, but vacancy is often like a landlord problem in the wealthiest neighborhoods in the poorest neighborhoods. You have like the Upper West Side and Leaker Street that have significant vacancy as well. And that seems to be like such an external thing for this, for this work district. I mean, it's such a like citywide problem and like retail trends and all. I just wondered, like, I know you didn't present all of your department Is there like other things you took into account when bringing in vacancy as a So, um, so I, I, I'm not sure we're using vacancy in precisely the same way. When, when I'm talking about vacancy in Baltimore, I'm talking about um, buildings that are unoccupied and uh, and no longer maintained. And in Baltimore, that's substantially a product of the fact that the population shrank. The population shrank by uh, 340,000 people from 1950 to 2000. And those people didn't all politely moved out of um, one neighborhood, they moved out from all over the city. So there are patches of vacancy, there are patches of no longer necessary housing, in some sense, all over the city of Baltimore. Um, and you, please correct me, but I think that, that I think that you are thinking of um, sort of vacant storefronts throughout Manhattan, and then also potentially um, homes that are owned by absentee property that are maintained at some basic level, um, as opposed to the, the ones I'm thinking of in Baltimore, which are in the process of succumbing to time. Does that, does that help? Yeah, I guess the word vacancy products. So in fact, it, it might be that abandonment is better, yeah. right? Vacancy leads to abandonment. It's not precisely the same thing um, since some vacant properties are occasionally maintained. Sometimes eventually sold back into you know being used, et cetera, et cetera. But um, but it's really a big thing for the most concerned. So these be that that was interesting that core was having trouble demolishing the buildings because they couldn't find the buildings. But going back at least as far as the 80s, maybe back to the 70s, Baltimore was a sort of poster child for demolishing abandoned warehouses. So do you compare vacant lots. I'm wondering if there was there were fewer vacancies in some of the non-designated areas because so much had already been demolished and there were a lot of vacant lots. Um, I, I didn't do that. That's an, a very interesting suggestion and it seems possible to me. Um, what I did gather through both my own research and actually research that one of my seniors was doing in my senior thesis seminar at the same time when I was working on the book was that demolition tends to have occurred and tends to continue to occur in neighborhoods where 
various real estate interests and government actors believe there is the possibility of redevelopment. And so that in neighborhoods where uh, in neighborhoods where there is less interest in the reuse of the real estate, there's simultaneously less demolition. Uh, the one of the maps that I didn't bring is a map of housing market type typologies for Baltimore and the patterns of demolition tend to map onto um, the neighborhoods in which have which have been typologized as effectively potentially useful in the near future. So, um, so, I, so the short answer would have been I don't know. Um, I think that's an interesting suggestion. Um, but the uh, the con what I what I did find was that the concentration that demolition was concentrated in neighborhoods that various people anticipated being able to develop in the future. Other other questions, thoughts, reactions. I'll throw one in that as I just um, I'm, I'm mindful of the the the, the, the stomachs rolling, you know, that need to go have some food. But you, um, in terms of materiality, um, you know, since you did mention the, the the fact that you had no no pictures of the buildings themselves, and since we love to see those pictures, um, how does materiality figure in your work? I mean, you you you. You put it forth in the book as something important to you, but how, apart from it just, um, you know, apart from saying that, like, how does the materiality pop up in the research? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, what, I, what I want to start by saying is that the significance of the materiality is in the deep background of the research. And it's in the deep background of a sense that one of the things, one of the, the motivating curiosities of the project was the sense that we urban dwellers live in stuff that is old. I don't have to tell you this. Uh, but so I am um, particularly emerging from my previous research, which was really about new suburban development. Right, returning for me, returning to the city and rediscovering a sense that um, that that we live amongst old things and the age of those things plays an important role in our relationship to them and our relationship to our, to our neighborhoods and relationships to one another. That was much of the motivating curiosity for this. So. Um, so it is the materiality of these neighborhoods is somewhat peripheral to the directions that the research ultimately took in the sense that um, I do think aesthetics are critical um, in, in the um, Brooklyn case in particular. The, the people I interviewed and the um, Community Board 3 Landmarks Committee meeting, the, um, the, uh, the details were essential. These, uh, these activists are really involved in the aesthetics of these historic places. Um, and um, and in, the, in the Baltimore case, um, the, the materiality of really came in more, honestly, with my own experience in doing the research. Um, I made a significant amount of time to walk around Baltimore a lot while I was doing work. And um, and it is um, it is both it's a it's a remarkable place uh, it's uh, in sort of encountering urban spaces uh, I'm not often scared and Baltimore sometimes left me disconcerted um, so so honestly again for me the um, materiality was as much in the motivation for the project as it is as it does show up in the uh, the the outcome of the project itself. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you.
when things return to normal, we will, we will return to having nibbles in the you know, in our lecture. In the, in the body as well as 